Alrighty, we'll go ahead and get started. So hi, everybody. Welcome to paper session six. Um, we have three presenters today who will each be presenting for about 20 minutes. Um, and then they'll also leave some time at the end of each of their time periods to answer some questions as well. So feel free to put any questions into the chat boxes. Um, and we'll go ahead and get and get started. Our three presenters today are Becky Bro, uh, Maddie Betts and Jean Gomez. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Becky. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, uh, thanks for coming. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a literature review that I did to prepare for um, my dissertation project. So to give you a little bit of background on myself, I'm an occupational therapist. I've been practicing for about 26 years. And for the last Three years I've been um, I've been also in school um, through the health and behavioral sciences department at CU Denver to get my PhD. Um, and so when I started thinking about kind of what I wanted to study for my project, um, one of the things that kind of kept coming to mind for me was the fact that I feel I've been in that clearly I've been in the field a long time, um, and I kind of have this sense that it just seems to be getting harder in some ways to do person-centered care and to do best practice. And I couldn't really put my thumb on that or really um, nail down why that is. And so I decided that that's kind of what I want to study is what are barriers and what are facilitators to person-centered care. Um, in terms of um, my broader dissertation project, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, my plan at this point is I'm doing a what's called an institutional ethnography. So I'll be immersing my, I am actually doing early preliminary data collection now. I'm immersing myself in the field. Um, I'm collecting data in the clinics. Um, and then I'm interviewing key stakeholders in the wheelchair seating and mobility provision process. So that includes the clinician, um, the, the client and their caregivers and the technology supplier. Um, and then I'm doing interviews with each of those key stakeholders. And ultimately I'm hoping to um, understand kind of how the macro, what happens at the, at the government, the organizational level, the industry level flows down to the micro level and back up again. And how, how does that all interact? But um, as you know, um, when you're doing a, a project like this, one of the first things you need to do is you need to do a really good literature review. So what I'm sharing with you today are the findings from, from that piece of, of my project. All right, hopefully this screen will actually, yeah, there we go. Okay, so what is person-centered care? Um, first of all, I just wanna note that I chose, I'm using the term person, um, but other terms like patient-centered, client-centered, family-centered, are the, I'm, I'm talking about all the same things. I've chosen the term person-centered care for, for my project because one, it's becoming kind of the more accepted term in the broader healthcare industry. And also um, because I think it kind of, it doesn't connote any kind of relationship between the individual and the healthcare provider. Um, it kind of drills down to their, the, mo the most basic part of them, their personhood. But if I were to read, and I did, I did a, um, a review. Of, I ended up with about 55 articles for this review. And I really focused in on the literature in the rehabilitation sciences, the assistive technology, and the CRT field. Um, if person-centered care is a huge topic, there are tens of thousands of articles that I could have I could have found. Um, if I were to read 50 articles on person-centered care, I would come up with 50 different definitions. So um, what I learned quickly is that really it's these conceptual underpinnings that are the most important in understanding what it really means. Um, it was named as one of the six pillars of quality care by the Institutes of Medicine in 2001, and they um, put out a mandate that all healthcare providers should, should strive to provide this type of care. Um, one of the conceptual underpinnings is that it, it looks at the individual holistically and recognizes that disease doesn't happen in a, or illness doesn't happen in a vacuum, that in addition to the medical condition, there's the uh, psychological, social, emotional components that are equally important in the process of healing the individual. Um, it's a process that realized the person, every person is different. We have to have individualized care, respectful care. 
And then importantly, it's the type of care where we're shifting power from the expert to the individual. Historically in American medicine, we are very steeped in this um, idea that the healthcare professional is the expert who has the power and the authority and the decision making. Um, and so this is a big, this is frankly a big shift that's hard to make. In order to make that shift, there's this, we have to develop this therapeutic relationship where we are empowering people to make decisions in this process. And then some would say that the easiest way to define person-centered care is by pointing out what it is not. So it is not disease-centered, technology-centered, physician-centered, or hospital-centered care. One of the reasons I wanted to use person-centered care when studying about how practices occur in CRT is because person-centered care is a key component of best practices in our field. And when you review the literature and just here at the at the conference, you know, over and over again, we're hearing about client-centered care and person-centered care. Um, so some of the key things in best practices in CRT that align with person-centered care are the idea, again, that we're giving the client autonomy, we're giving them choice by doing equipment trials, um, we're working as a multidisciplinary team that must collaborate and effective, effectively communicate with one another, we um, are looking at the whole person and, and how they use their equipment, not just in the hospital, but in, in all their environments and the emotional and the social and the psychological aspects of this piece of equipment that's an extension of yourself, basically. Um, and then we, we need to do all this um, by sharing decisions and realizing that every team member has this unique expertise that they're bringing to the table. But the literature, um, the literature is pretty clear and I think practices are clear too that although we try to implement person-centered care, it's not consistently implemented. Um, some researchers noted that this provider-centered or expert-driven model of care continues to occur. There were studies um, in the occupational therapy field where clients were interviewed and they found that their therapists were paternalistic in nature, kind of talking down to them, condescending. Um, we, there are studies that show individuals are not getting opportunities to try devices regularly before having to make big decisions or, or feeling like they're getting um, information they need. And then um, there's general, there's some consensus among some researchers that even though healthcare professionals value person-centered care, they're not always able to implement it. I wanted to find out a little bit about the history, and this is like a super quick review of the history of person-centered care, but um, where, where did this whole concept come from? And it comes from lots of different places, but some would say it, the earliest beginnings come from Florence Nightingale, who is the founder, many consider her the founder of modern nursing. And one of her most important contributions was she really believed in, in the power of empathy and that you have to treat the person and not the disease. And then if you fast forward to the 1940s and 50s, Carl Rogers was um, a psychotherapist who wrote a book um, he, about, about client-centered and person-centered care. He coined the terms, as far as I know, he's the first to use the terms. Um, and one of the things that he felt was most important is this idea of listening. He felt like of all the things you can do as a healthcare provider, you must be able to listen. And that this is key in developing this shared partnership with the, with the person you're, the individual, so that you're working together. And it's not, again, you as a professional doing something for them or to them, but you're working together. Then in the 1970s, George Engel is a uh, psychiatrist who wrote kind of a seminal article about moving away, the importance of moving away from the biomedical model and moving towards the biopsychosocial model. He was the first to really put into really good terms why it's so important to, tr to see all aspects of the, of the person and not overly focus on the illness and disease. And then in the 1970s through the 1990s, we had this rise in the consumerism and the disability rights movements and the rise of the critical uh, disabilities theories, all of these things where people with disabilities began demanding um, to have a say, to have a voice, to have choice, and to be an equal partner in the healthcare process. 
So in terms of what are the impacts of person-centered care on healthcare service, unfortunately, there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of evidence out there to show if you use a person-centered care approach, you save money or you have better outcomes. Most of the information out there is really expert knowledge that suggests that even though providing person-centered care typically takes more time, especially in the beginning, because you're developing a relationship and trust and you're listening and you're setting goals, um, that the, up, the upfront costs are offset by the improved outcomes and greater efficiencies of care in the long term. Um, there are some empir uh, empirical studies uh, in, that were um, experimental in nature that found that clients who were um, treated with a person-centered care approach showed better ad adherence to healthcare programs and medication protocols. Um, there are also studies that were interview and survey studies that found that um, clients who were enrolled in a program that took a client-centered approach they felt that they had were had more participation in the in the experience. They had greater feelings of self-efficacy and higher levels of satisfaction. And what I would say, out of all of the research that I've read, one of the most consistent findings is that person-centered care is is very consistently linked to higher levels of satisfaction from the client. And then for our um, in industry specifically, there is um, a good bit of research that demonstrates that person-centered care reduce, reduces rates of technology abandonment. So what are some known barriers to person-centered care? I divided these into kind of four different buckets. Um, the first being political and cultural buckets. So um, politically and culturally, we're looking at the organization or the industry or policies or money, things that can impact decision-making. So one, of the, one important barrier is that if the organization um, or the entity, whatever that might be, if they don't have a philosophy, a mission, a strategic plan or policies that specifically value and support person-centered care, it's much, it's much less likely to happen. Once again, the prevalence of the medical model and this paternalistic care is, is alive and well. As much as we like to think we're, we're moving beyond it, it's very much still um, a part of our um, American healthcare system. In part, this can be due to the fact that some providers have a hard time letting go of their role as the expert because it brings certain status with it. They may have trouble um, letting go of control of knowledge and sharing that knowledge, which can lead to challenges with decision making, power struggles. And also, there, in many cases, there can be turf wars between professionals especially in team making situations where they're not really sure who's gonna be responsible for what part of the knowledge or the, or the task. There are also um, financial limitations. Um, these are really kind of obvious, but um, it's, it, again, in general, we think person-centered care, at least upfront takes more time. So when there's time to demands or, or productivity standards placed on the individual, it's going to be harder to implement the practice. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of organizations focus on cost effectiveness and cost efficiency in the short term, and they're not looking at the long term picture and the long term benefits of kind of making that investment in the beginning and then seeing the results later. And then once again, we don't have hard and fast numbers to back that up either which is, I think, another reason why the, the short-term vision is kind of what's prevailing in many cases. Conceptually, there, is an there are inconsistent definitions or a lack of definitions or key terms and ideas. So if I were to ask everybody here, how would you define autonomy? We would probably all have a little bit of a different definition. Um, it, the concepts are, are, are a little tricky in some cases. Um, there's a lack of knowledge and understanding about how to implement person-centered care in everyday work. It's one thing to know what it is, and it's another thing to figure out how to actually implement it practically in the real world. 
Um, in some cases, there's um, issues where I think people just don't, again, don't understand what person-centered care is. Some studies found that people blamed the client for not being engaged. Well, they wouldn't set goals, so I couldn't provide client-centered care. Well, that's fundamentally a misunderstanding of what person-centered care is in the first place, because ultimately you're meeting them where they are. And then there's an oversimplification. Well, I set goals, I checked that box, I provided person-centered care when it's much more involved than um, a checklist. And then finally, there can be attitudinal barriers um, where people simply feel like it's just too hard, it takes too much time, or in some cases, the, the individual's goals might be in direct, or values might be in direct con conflict with the healthcare provider's values. And so sometimes that incongruence can lead to ad attitudinal barriers as well. So um, in terms of my study that I'm, that I'm launching at this moment, at this point in time, um, one of the things that motivated me to do that is I read an article by Cohen et al, where they were doing a review of all the different types of models of wheelchair service mobility delivery. And in, in, in their article, they stated, there's a need to study not only the what of healthcare delivery, but also the how. And that's really what I hope to do. I hope to study and understand how healthcare services are being delivered in the real world um, and why person-centered care is even be, either being delivered successfully or unsuccessfully. And I hope ultimately to come back um, next year and, and be able to report some of my results. So that is it, thank you. Oh, um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at this um, address, I'd be happy to I, this is something I like talking about, so I'd love your feedback or ideas. And I have no idea if there are any questions. <laughs> it doesn't look like there were. So if um, anybody does have a question, feel free to pop one in um, and then we will move on to Maddie, our next presenter. All right, let me get some things out of the way. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Madeline and I am presenting on a case study that I completed for one of my courses um, in the last spring semester for the Masters of Rehabilitation Technology program at Pitt. Um, this was part of our clinical applications of seating and mobility um, course. And the title of my presentation is Identifying an Optimal Mono Ski Rig for an Advanced Recreational Skier. So learning objectives for this um, presentation are to identify three aspects of the HAT model, which I'll get into um, that can be directly related to adaptive sports, describe five components of the um, athlete evaluation that influence technology selection, and then list three stakeholders who can assist the adaptive athlete with choosing the best combination of sports technologies. So the HAT model stands for um, human performing an activity using assistive technology within um, a context. This can be social, um, physical context, or the institutional context. Um, and this is kind of a framework by Cook and Polger and Arna and Karnakow, um, and is typically used for assessing more mainstream technologies um, like wheelchairs and things of that nature. Um, but I wanted to apply it to the adaptive sports world and looking at seating applications for adaptive sports equipment because it's not always something that we think about. So this case study um, is about an athlete that I had the chance to ski with um, last spring. He is 58 years old, about six feet, 190 pounds. He sustained a spinal cord injury um, to the T11, T12 area, and he has uh, some sensation below his level of injury, but no functional movement. Looking at his activities, he's an avid weekend warrior, super active, um, tennis, hand cycling, skiing, all of the sports. Um, he works full time and is very family oriented. So being able to participate in these family sports is something that's really important to him. 
He uses a custom ultra lightweight manual wheelchair. He has a fully accessible minivan that he uses to transport his sports equipment. And in terms of looking at his monoski specifically, he is skiing on a 20 year old Proshberger monoski. Um, and kind of the whole purpose of is of this um, project, I guess you could say, is to look at new skis and see what's out there on the market. Looking at the physical context, we're on the ski mountain. Um, can he get his ski independently to the to the lift from the car? Um, is he able to navigate the the mountain as it is safely and effectively? Kind of socially, he is a recreational skier. Again, um, family skiing is really important to him. Um, and then looking at the institutional context, what are the funding sources or the funding opportunities for adaptive sports equipment? Because it is a little bit different than um, getting a wheelchair covered by, by insurance. So this is our athlete at uh, Breckenridge, which is in Colorado. The Breckenridge Outdoor Education Center is the local adaptive sports program. And so the athlete got to trial a couple different uh, mono skis from this, uh, from this organization, which is really cool. So this is our athlete on his current 20 year old uh, mono ski. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about his seating is he really likes a specific way of sit sitting. He has about 100 degrees of hip flexion, about 90 degrees of knee flexion, and that's something that's really important to him. Some other, if you've seen other mono skiers, have a lot of different sitting positions. Some people have their um, legs pretty extended and others have them even tucked in more. Um, the other thing that we are considering is the amount of seat slope. So the bucket kind of off the shelf comes with a certain degree of seat slope and our athlete minimized that even further just for his comfort. Um, he does have some good trunk stability based on his uh, level of spinal cord injury. And he is a really experienced skier. I mean, he's been skiing on this for 20 years. So he, he knows what he likes and it's just about figuring out the new technology. Um, we worked closely with a couple of instructors at the BOEC, the Adaptive Sports Center there, um, who have so much experience with like the biomechanics of skiing and how to teach skiing, but also what the technology, what are the limits of the technology um, and what are the pros and cons of each one. And then we also worked with a physical therapist with um, a lot, a uh, really extensive background in seating applications just to make sure that we address all of those needs in that new ski. So our athlete tried two different models of mono skis, the, um, the Hydra and the Nissan. The Hydra, um, it's not a great picture, but I have a video later, um, was he had a really great time on this. Um, it was easy to load the chairlift, but it was kind of over-engineered and expensive. And one thing I wanted to highlight was the uh, seat to floor height. Um, this is something that is important to take into consideration when you're loading on the chairlift. And again, I'll show you that in that video. And he really liked that overall seat to floor height and made it really um, easy, a lot easier to transfer into and then also to get onto the chairlift. On the right here is the Nissan monoski. Um, this is a lot more similar to his current Proshberger ski. So it's, it has a lower overall um, seat to floor height, easier to lay over in turns, and it is more affordable. But the kind of locking mechanism that allows him to uh, load the chairlift was challenging. And it is similar to his current ski. So we're kind of just weighing the options of, do we want something similar or do we want to go with something a little bit different? A little bit more in depth, um, each of the mono skis. So when I'm talking about the rig, I'm talking about like this piece right here. There's a lot of other components that go along to um, an adaptive sports or an adaptive ski like this. And some of the things that I wanted to point out about the Dynaxis Hydra is that the suspension models are um, created to kind of mimic uh, able-bodied biomechanical skiing patterns of like the shift in uh, center of gravity through turns. Um, the ski, uh, both of these skis are made for a range of skiers from intermediate to advanced skiers all the way up to those competitive racers. The Hydra does have that overall seat to floor height, the higher one, um, it is lightweight, very low maintenance, um, doesn't have as many um, moving parts. And they also, uh, the company's based here in the US. So they have great customer service, but just the rig alone goes for about $9,000, which is 
um, a pretty penny. Looking at the Nissen, one of the benefits of the Nissen is that it's very adjustable. So this is a great ski for people who are trying to figure out their city seating. They don't know exactly what it is they like. And so there's a lot of adjustability in changing these things. Um, has a lower overall, lower overall seat to floor height. It is lightweight. Um, because it has more of these moving parts, it is a little bit higher maintenance and the company is based internationally. So getting a hold of customer service might be challenging. It is a little bit more affordable at $7,000, um, but again, uh, an expensive investment. So something we'll consider also. So I have a couple of videos. This is our athlete in the Hydra, which is the first mono ski. Um, he is a little bit choppier in his turns, but this is a really different ski than what he's used to. And I think this is only like the second or third run. This is him in the second ski. Um, and you can see his turns seem a little bit smoother. And I think that's just because it's really similar to his current ski. And then this is a sped up version of our athlete loading the chairlift. Um, he has some help for this um, during this lesson, just because he was in an official lesson with the Adaptive Sports Center. But one thing that is really important to our athlete is independence. Um, he has been and will continue to load the chairlift independently and be able to engage that loading mechanism, which basically is um, once he pushes up, the there's like a lock so that his essentially his butt can stays up and the chair comes underneath. So all of these things are really important. Um, and when we're looking at new skis. So looking at seating specifically, um, our athlete has a pretty straightforward sitting presentation, nothing um, super um, abnormal that we need to consider. Level pelvis, even leg length, has had no serious um, issues with skin integrity previously and does have good balance from um, good trunk control based on his level of injury. So looking at the ski bucket specifically, um, Ride Designs is based here in Colorado and does a lot of their, uh, a lot of the custom seating for different sports and um, is a great resource for looking at any level of intervention from off the shelf to highly customized seating. Um, based on this, our athlete doesn't need a super, super custom seating system because he has um, a little bit of sensation, good trunk control, all of those things. So we chose, or we're looking at um, a Ride Designs rigid bucket. This is just off the shelf. And then uh, using a, a fit kit, which is like the low profile version. And the point of this fit kit is to A, add overall padding. You don't want to sit in like a hard plastic shell for a whole day of skiing. I would be really problematic. So the point of the fit kit is to um, offload ischial tuberosities. You see this wedge here on the top picture, um, loading the proximal thigh to offload ischial tuberosities. And then down here, these are called thigh guides and the hole is uh, cut out here and is used to um, offload trochanters. So other things that we're looking at for seating is a pelvic belt, thigh strap, lower leg strap and foot strap. And these are all kind of just standard for skiing for making sure that the person in the ski are secure. So looking at how much it costs, um, skiing is a very expensive sport just to begin with. Um, it is hard to get into the sport. And then when we're looking at adaptive equipment, it just gets so expensive. Um, it depends on a lot of different things. These are just some of the additional pieces of equipment that you need to be able to be an effective skier. Um, so it can range anywhere between eight to $11,000 and it is expensive. So what are some funding options? Um, insurance unfortunately does not cover adaptive sports equipment because it's not seen as medically necessary as like a power chair or a manual wheelchair is. Um, if our athlete was a veteran, it's highly likely that the Veterans Administration would cover a um, ski like this, but unfortunately he is not. He could pay out of pocket um, again, that's definitely an option, but it is a higher price tag. And then looking at foundation support. These are just some of the foundations here in the US that are really supportive of getting adaptive athletes grants to cover um, their equipment, their training, that kind of thing. And so this is definitely the route that we're going to look at um, in terms of getting this ski funded. 
So in terms of like next steps, um, you know, the, the service delivery model for adaptive sports equipment is not the exact same as like a wheelchair is, but there are a lot of overlaps. So, you know, we did the assessment, we did like a very straightforward seating assessment where we trialed a bunch of different devices. And then kind of the next step is choosing one or trialing more and ordering. So our athlete is kind of going down the Hydra route. Um, he really liked that ski. It was really fun. And above all, fun and independence are what he wants and focuses on the most. Um, we're going to look at applying for a combination of grants and paying out of pocket. Uh, additionally, working with Ride Designs and Aspen Seating here in Denver for dialing this, dialing in the seating system. Um, this is kind of an iterative process that might take a couple of tries. And then working on this so that we can get everything done before next ski season and he can um, have a good time out in the mountain. So yeah, that's all I have for this case presentation. Um, adaptive sports are very near and dear to my heart. And through my you know formal education at Pitt in the rehab science and technology program, it's been really interesting to kind of connect those two because there is so much overlap that, you know, if someone has a a very customized seating system for their power wheelchair. Um, we can't just throw them in a in a bare bucket and expect things to um, go well for them to have the the control and the comfort that they need. So that's all I have for you. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, if you want to come off mute, or I can answer them in the chat. Um, I actually have a question for you, Maddie. Yeah. Um, the therapist that you worked with, um, as far as with, you know, kind of figuring out the device and such, was that through like a volunteer aspect or was that therapist, was it through like a clinic that he participated in appointments to kind of figure that out? Yeah. So luckily, um, our athlete has a lot of really close connections in the wheelchair world. So um, the therapist was like a family friend and was helping out that day um, just to make sure that we could get everything dialed in. Um, in kind of more of a typical adaptive sports realm, uh, therapists are not often involved in um, seating, you know, in like a you, just like a standard mountain adaptive sports um, center. And so that's something that is really important is educating the um, instructors and the consumers on advocating for themselves for proper seating interventions. So um, this case was a little bit um, different than kind of a typical um, adaptive sports um, center experience. Thank you. And then I don't know if you saw a few of the questions that came through in the chat. Yeah, I'll go through those. Thank you. So I'm reading Adam's um, set of questions to use to make the chart you presented. So um, are you talking about like the uh, chart at the beginning with the human activity and assistive technology? Um, yeah, so that's um, something that's kind of a standard, or not a standard, but it's a uh, part of the textbook by Cook, Bulger, and, El and Karnako. Um, and it's used to evaluate all different kinds of assistive technology. And so um, there's a lot of different ways that you can approach gathering that information. Um, and basically, I just like to ask, like, tell me a little bit about yourself. What are your goals? And we can kind of work through through those. I don't really have like a list of specific questions. The type of ski lift seems like a variable. Is there any attempt to standardize the accessible chair lift? So that's an interesting question. Um, for um, active skiers out there, there's these new kind of chair lifts that have, we call them the bubble. They have a thing that comes over the top so that it blocks the wind. Um, and it's heated and it's very comfy cushy. But the issue is, is that mono skis cannot load on those kinds of lifts. Um, when someone loads a lift, proper safety standards are for them to attach a daisy chain from their ski, um, like the back of their ski, all the way around the chairlift in the event that they were to fall, um, they have a safety set in place. And so 
this is something access chairlift accessibility is a challenge because um, uh, the typical public doesn't know how to accommodate people who need different ways to get on the chairlift. So essentially the answer is no, there is no standardized way. Um, it kind of just is what it is, but there are challenges with new um, chairlifts coming up also. Yeah, and I'll throw the um, reference for the textbook in the chat um, so you can get that too, Adam. Any more questions? Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much, Maddie. Um, and I will turn it over now to Jean. All right. So can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. So thanks everyone for joining. My name is Jean Gomez. I'm a former student of the master's program uh, for rehabilitation technology at Pitt. Disclosure statement as of late December 2021. I'm an employee of the Adaptive Driving Program for which this paper session is about. So today I'm presenting the field work that turned into my scholarly paper, uh, Adaptive Driving Program, UPMC and CAT, inside look at clientele and factors influencers or fitness to drive. So today we'll first provide some background information, then I'll move on to the services provided, price. A briefly go over the fiscal year, uh, leading to the referral process, just to give you a, a better idea how it all works out. Then I'll go into the data analysis, which is this main presentation, results, and then Q&A session. So the Adaptive Driving Program, also known as ADP, is a driving rehabilitation program in the Center for Assistive Technology. It is managed and operated by Ms. Amy Lane and her assistant Ruth. This project originally uh, started as a follow-up for revenue report back in 2018. However, the data collection that was, that was gotten in 2019 included revenue, but also the following variables. We have primary diagnosis, visual acuity, license restrictions, outcome evaluation, and the training, the type of vehicle, and the adaptive equipment. The purpose of all of this was to analyze the demographics as well as investigate the function, the visual acuity and cognition, if any, play in fitness to drive. So ADP provides services for clients with neurological, cognitive, perceptual, physical, and age-related impairments. This includes comprehensive evaluations, vehicle mods, training, and using the vehicle for PANDA road tests. This project, however, focuses on the outcomes of both the clinical and the behind-the-wheel components, as this makes up the comprehensive evaluation. So here we have the revenue for 2019. ADP mainly receives its income from five primary sources. 63% of it was made up from private payers since driver rehab is not covered by insurance. OBR and religious congregations made up 34% of the revenue. ADP has some contracts with congregations as it is part of the policy for their members to be evaluated on their driving performance on a yearly basis. Now, referral process can be broken down into four parts. The, in order for the client to undergo a driver rehab eval. Jean, quick refer, question. Yes. Did you have slides that you were intending to share? Uh, no, but I can. Okay, we were just checking. We weren't sure if you were trying to share your screen and it hadn't shared. Oh, is it not sharing right now? No, it is not. Darn. Why didn't you tell me? I'm kidding. All right, there we go. My apologies, everyone. Perfect. So, I mean, I can go back. So these are the services provided and the pricing. There we go. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the comprehensive eval is composed of two parts, uh, clinical and behind the wheel assessment. There are other services provided, vehicle mods, driver's training, license tests and travel times. And sometimes Amy does tend to go out maybe even up to an hour and drive away to provide an evaluation or any other services. This is the revenue. Uh, as you can see, mainly over half of it is from private payers since driver rehab is not considered an essential thing, unfortunately, by insurance. I don't know why. 
And this is a referral process. My apologies for not being able to share before. So first you need a, you need a referral from primarily your PCT. Once a referral is made, the client can contact ADP to schedule an appointment. Now this is mainly done over the phone, very rarely is it done by email. Ruth, the assistant, she will inform the client of like next steps and just basically provide a recap of the process. The, an intake form is either sent to the client by mail or electronically, whichever one they prefer. And this is just to kind of like request some basic information. You get the age, diagnosis, maybe some other driving history, and of course the contact info. The client, once they have all of that together, they'll send the paperwork to ADP, and this gets along with the $165 payment. The $235, the behind the wheel, that's not given until the end of the evaluation, mainly because depending on the clinical test scores and the presentation of the client, and of course their license status, they may or may not complete that portion of the evaluation. And the clinical test, just to kind of give everyone a better idea, they measure physical functioning, visual, visual perception, cognition, just all the vital skills needed for driving. Now, the referral can also be voluntarily or it can be mandatory. And by this, I mean, there are certain medical conditions that are required by law to be reported to PENDA due to the possibility of impairing the client's ability to drive. So for instance, after a stroke, a person is not allowed to drive for a period of six months if they experience loss of consciousness, paralysis, or vision loss. So if any of those symptoms were present, the appropriate healthcare personnel notifies PennDOT, and then that person will get um, a letter in the mail and just kind of like saying, hey, your driver's license is currently under medical recall. You know, and, in order for those driving privileges to be reinstated, the physician, uh, usually the one that made the report to PENDA has to complete certain forms. And then the client has also to pass a comprehensive eval, such as the one provided by ADP. So now that I explained that, I can dig into the data analysis and how it, this project was put in together. So there was a total of 243 clients in 2019. This was an increase from the previous year. Clients were first divided by gender, and then we arranged them into six age groups. Over 51% of them were 70 years old, and there was just slightly more men than women. A total of 11 population categories were created based on the diagnosis and or reason for referral. Top reasons were cognition impairments, it related, post-stroke, and other neurological concern, uh, conditions such as MS for instance. Now, age-related primarily refers to the clients that came from religious congregations. Uh, as I, I mentioned earlier on that it is in their policy to be evaluated when they reach a certain age. I believe it's around 65 and on. So out of those 243 clients, four were excluded because they were seen for vehicle modifications. There are remaining remainder 239. They went through a comprehensive eval. This is also known as a pre-driver evaluation or PDE. This is made up of two parts. So you have the clinical assessment, then you can do the on-road portion if it's recommended. The assessment route for the driving portion is typically 60 minutes long in a variety of traffic environments. Main outcomes were training or remediation, here to drive and driver cessation, or also known as your, your recommended not to to no longer drive. So we'll be focusing on those 86 clients and the 35 that were told or recommend not to drive anymore. In addition to the four clients that were excluded, 27 more were also taken out of this project just because they had issues relating to license status. So their license was either under recall, suspended or expired. And we also had a, about 75% of them that did not have a learner's permit. And these clients were mainly from OVR. Typically OVR asks um, clients to have an evaluation just to determine if they'll re require any additional services not provided by regular driving programs. So if they'll need extra time learning how to drive 
or the possibility of driving of adaptive equipment. The 82 clients that were recommended training, they were also not considered, but their data was still analyzed just for educational purposes. Training was considered when a client needed to either restore a driving skill or just basically learn to drive with adaptive equipment. These recommendations were obviously made on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, of those 82 clients that went through training, 74% were introduced to and prescribed with adaptive equipment. These are also known as hand controls. The six main populations that used these devices were other neuro, stroke, amputation, neuropathy, spinal cord, and orthopedic. And then here we can see a summary of the type of adaptive equipment that was prescribed. 50 clients were recommended to use spinner knobs. These are steering aids that are designed to allow the driver to rotate the steering wheel in a much easier way. It is very beneficial for clients that have paralysis or even those that have, have um, sometimes even neuropathy. Uh, main hand controls were the push rock and push pull. On the right here, we have the Bible Detroit, which is now mobility innovations, push rock. Um, and this is already installed in the bubble. This is one of the vehicles that we have. Now, the reason why this was prescribed over the push pull more often is because it's very close in proximity to the secondary controls and also has a very short learning curve. And on this picture, we can also see the clamshell on the 10 and 2 o'clock position. This is where the spinner knob is attached. Now, there's different types of spinner knobs. They're each tailored to the driver's personal needs. The mushroom cap over here, this is the one most used by the ADP program. And on the right, we have the mechanical left foot accelerator. It's designed for people that have either limited or no mobility on the right low extremity. Um, a lot of the clients that have used this were they either had an amputation, stroke, or neuropathy. Uh, there was also one client in 2019 that was prescribed with the RF360. This acts both as a steering aid and a switch. So we can actually control the steering wheel and just activate controls like headlights and the horns. I think it has up to 12 functions. Now, AP has two vehicles, so Bill Luxury and a Volvo S90. The table on the right here shows the number of times each vehicle was used. Both have in-vehicle technologies, also known as Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, or best known as ADAS. And these are, in, these are designed to improve driver safety. Studies show that when properly executed, it can actually enhance the ability to maintain good vehicle control and even improve reaction times. So the type of features vary by vehicle, and so does the alert. You can either have a visual, sometimes you can have like a flashing icon, it can be auditory or haptic, which just means that there'd be like a slight steering wheel force on the system. And this is just a sample of the available features in the ADP cars. We have adaptive cruise control, adaptive headlight, blind spot warning, head up display, forward collision, uh, lane departure warning. Some can be found in both vehicles, like lane departure warning, while head up display is only available in the Volvo. So depending on the clinical presentation or limitations of the client, a vehicle can be selected over another. So, there are some benefits, uh, as, as you can see. So blind spot warning, so or BSW, it, is, it has shown to be beneficial to the aging population. And over 50% of the clients from ADP, they were over 70 years old. So this is greatly beneficial to that because it allows for clients with either limited range of motion or just the inability to turn. They don't really have to require those head checks. They'll still be able to do them, but it would just give them that extra benefit of the fact that they don't have to turn their body as much. And studies does show that when used collectively, the systems help prevent crashes. Of course, it's not gonna take over the component of making sure you have those mirror checks, those uh, head checks, but it'll just be able to raise aware, uh, situational awareness for the driver. And here we have just two graphs. I lay it out by either age groups, and diagnosis just to show the popularity. The Buick was almost the same uh, use in comparison to the Volvo, but it was definitely more popular with clients that were over 70 years, 
70 years old. And then when it came to, and, and it's very obvious when you just break it down to, what was the reason for them being here? So cognitive impairment, age-related issues, is we just tend to gear more towards the um, global, I mean, the Buick, just for that reason, because it's just, for the reason for the age and the presentation, there's just more familiar sense. The bubble has all these new gadgets, so it's, it can be a little more, more confusing for some people. And now the project itself, it was first broken down by visual acuity. So we had 2020 or better, 2030 and 2040. And then it was broken down, but whether or not the client had a license restriction, this was a simple yes or no, and that meant did they wear glasses or corrected lenses. It was also broken down by the outcome evaluation, simple pass or fail. We were not focusing on did they require training or remediation. And lastly, it was just, it was popularized based on diagnosis. So once again, we had 243 clients, four were excluded uh, due to vehicle mods, one was, another client was excluded because their visual acuity was not on file, and then two others were excluded because their visual acuity was outside the range of 2040. And here we can see the total numbers. Now for license restrictions, um, the 2020 group, as you, uh, the top graph shows those that pass, and on the bottom you can see those that fail. So the group in 2020, they had a likelihood more chance of passing as it got further down the list in regards to visual acuity. There was more likelihood of, of failing, but also these clients in their notes and recommendations, there was some concern when it came to uh, cognition, whether or not it was intact. So the outcome of the evaluation, it was either pass or fail. So pass, you're clear to drive, there's no issues with you. Fail meant that you are more than likely recommended to just stop driving since there were some concerns that were observed either during the pre-driver's evaluation, the clinical portion, or even during the driving component. So these issues can be seen during some of the clinical tests when it came to short-term memory skills, visual spatial organization, divided attention, road sign recognition, um, and when it came to the behind the wheel component, the main things that were flagged were if they require assistance when it came to lane positioning and steering ability, and in certain cases, um, steering and braking interventions from the CDRS. So, uh, more than half of the clients that were seen, uh, they were referred for cognitive impairment, the ones that were taken into consideration for this project. Only seven of them uh, were referred for age-related impairments, but in the commentary section of their evaluation, it was very highly expressed that there was some concern when it came to cognition. And their clinical scores were getting close to the uh, point of failing, but they were just not quite there yet. So you can make that justification that it was due to cognition. Um, there was a small group that they were recommended to come back for a reevaluation, just because again, there was that slow reaction time during the clinical portion and even the driving itself. And the table on the right-hand side just kind of breaks down the categories of, of the clients. So as you can see, 21, uh, 21 of them fail and they belong to the cognitive impairment group. Seven were age-related, but again, they also have a slight concern when it came to cognition, other neuro, uh, stroke, and orthopedic. So what does this all mean? Um, more than half the fail belong to the 2030 group. However, this was not, uh, there was no clear way to make a correla uh, correlation for them to fail when it came to visual acuity. Um, no, so no significant relations that could be established when it came to vision param parameters. Um, cognitive impairment, however, they showed to have a high correlation when it came to pass or fail. And if the client had a, a visual acuity over 2040 and some cognitive issues, then the likelihood of failing increased. 
So findings from this project definitely concur with existing results in the topic of driver safety. Uh, that is, driver safety might not be jeopardized by clients in the low vision range. That is assuming cognition is intact. So the, and actually in fact, when, it, when we came to see was the visual acuity is not found to be associated to vehicle accidents, nor is it actually a factor in precluding them. So we just want to be really enforced that one should look beyond visual acuity requirements when assessing a person's ability to drive. And of course, with training from the CDRS and how to best utilize those adaptive safety, like blind, blind smart warnings, the someone with visual impairments can definitely attain or maintain a licensure. Uh, so basically overall, we just wanna make sure that active driver rehab programs are taken into consideration when appraising driver safety and not just focus on cognition. And that is it. Any questions? Sorry, I went too fast, but I messed up in the beginning, so. Jean, I have a related question because um, my mother just went through this actually. So mm -hmm. when you when you go into um, any any driver program from state to state, are the evaluations and the assessment process standardized? or does each entity kind of do it their own way? Uh, so it's kind of a little bit of both because each state has, when it comes to vision, they have different, they're not all on the same page, unfortunately. And, but when you have the driver rehab program, they, they, they follow like I said, protocol from, there is NIDA and the ADA organization, which is for the driver, driver rehab specialists. So it's, Unfortunately, when it comes to like the actual DMV licensure, there's no, there's no standardized way, but the driver rehab specialists, they do have a sort of protocol to follow. They may do different types of testing, but it's, yeah, it's kind of like a little bit of both. Unfortunately, it's not the same all across the nation. So it's kind of a little bit difficult to just make the final determination and even recommendations for it. So I'm not sure that answers your question. No, that's like, good. So if, if you don't pass, does that, I'm just curious what evidence there is to support the tests versus the recommendation, or is it more clinical judgment, do you think? Uh, well, a big chunk of it is actually the clinical, because that is the first thing you're going to see. Um, so uh, you have trails A, trails B, there's tests. There's clinical tests to uh, test just your divided attention and reaction time. And those have actually, there's, there's a lot of research out there when it comes to how it relates to driving. Okay. So there, there, there is research out there, just, that's, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm that's like, Yeah, it, it's, I was like, I wish I, could, I had the actual clinical test to like kind of like show it along. Because I know it's just a lot of info, it's definitely. Um, no, that's very and, helpful. That's helpful to me. Thank you. I, I'm um, curious. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's, it's a world that's not very touch my. Uh, and uh, yes, the ADA features, so they, were, they were activated. Sometimes they were turned off depending on the clinical presentation of the client. So if there was a developmental disorder and let's say we just wanted to take out any extra distractions. So sometimes we would just turn off those features just to make sure that that would not be distracted to the driver. Uh, sometimes we had them on because if we, were, we were seeing during the driving portion that they were benefiting for that. So it was both, it, either we would turn them on or we would turn them off. It really depended on a case by case basis. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, the CEU code is QPCJSP. I've also provided that in the chat box. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, you're welcome to add those in there.